Spend enough time in this city, and you'll realize that Montreal's unifying feature is its diversity. And if there's one place that reflects this best, it's the Mile End. Historically, the Mile End has always been a mix of residential and industrial. It is a unique blend of bohemianism and business, a rich, multicultural hub. It is cosmopolitan, but with a small town feel. The history of manufacturing in the Mile End spans two centuries. And in recent years, it has become home to highly specialized artisans who've set up small, vibrant ateliers and old factories. Today, we will meet three craftspeople who built thoroughly modern businesses, a leather worker, a fashion designer, and a modern day neighborhood blacksmith. A man who has dedicated his life to working with metal, Jacques Gallant has spent the last 13 years forging his career as a modern-day blacksmith. With a business built on custom metalwork, Gallant's projects range from the practical to the whimsical, the artistic to the everyday. I found this piece of metal outside. I'm going to see what Jacques can make out of it. It looks like a spring clip here uh, from the train tracks. That probably means that we've got a pretty high quality piece of carbon steel here. If you went and just bought this as raw material, it would be fairly expensive. Nice. That's something that we can, uh, we can heat treat, we can temper, we could turn it into a blade of some sort. I think there's enough metal in here. Uh, let's say we could probably make you a little, uh, little hatchet for when you go camping. What do you say? That'd be great. Tell me what the distinction is between a metal worker and a blacksmith. Well, a blacksmith is somebody who specializes in uh, working iron and steel, mainly. I do work other metals, too. Um, but someone who specializes in heating up metal and where it gets soft when it gets hot, and then you can bend it and with your, you know, with your hands. You don't need a machine anymore. And you can pound it into different shapes with a hammer. and the black in blacksmith. So a blacksmith has that name because, um, you know, steel, if it's polished, it can be very shiny, uh, but when it heats up, uh, when it's red hot, when it's glowing, um, it's, it's oxidizing. The rust, you know, the normal, like, orange, red color rust that you see, it's happening really fast um, because of the high temperature, and it, the metal's actually turning this kind of dark gray black on the surface. So when you're done working it, it's dark colored, it looks black, that's why we call it the blacksmith. This is my first hammer. I made this from, uh, from an old truck axle. I, uh, I'm almost embarrassed to show it off, but uh, you know, it's a pretty cool piece of work, and I was just a teenager when I did this. And... When did you realize that, oh yeah, this is, this is a career path that's plausible and, um, and it, uh, it's gonna work for me? Well, there, there you've caught me. When I arrived here and um, in this shop space where we are right now and opened my business, I didn't have a business plan. Okay. Um, I was still doing some architectural lighting contract work at the time, but I really wanted to get the shop going. And, you know, I already had enough people who knew me as somebody who, you know, worked in metal a bit. And I had a, a, a smaller little shop at the time. And so I started just putting the word out more. And honestly, I didn't really know what kind of work I was going to be getting and what sorts of things I was going to end up doing. So I didn't show up here with this idea of like, oh yeah, I'm gonna do this thing in this really certain way. I just opened the doors and I let everyone around me, wow. you know, build the shop. I have a lot of tools for working on bicycle frames. Uh, I'm a welder, so if somebody Somebody's they've been riding the same bike for 10 years, it gets a crack in it, they bring it here, I'm gonna fix it up for them. So uh, the short answer is I won't chew your horse, but I will weld your bicycle. Okay. I definitely would 
shy away from any job that has me sitting in front of my computer than, for more than you know two or three hours a day. We're lifting the weight and then bringing it down. All right. The rewarding part of the work is when I'm standing up and when I'm moving and when I'm at the anvil and when I'm cutting metal and using your hands. Yeah, when I'm putting it together. And that's really, you know, I, I have to do the admin work, but I'm here for the shop work. And that's the time that's the most precious to me and that I enjoy the most. Bingo! Try to kick it into your opponent's boots. Oh, jeez. I didn't. The thing that I enjoy most about it is helping people uh, how to figure out what they want to make, what they have in their head, and then actually making it. It's seeing every idea through until there's actually the, the final physical thing sitting in front of you. It's, it's a very rewarding, gratifying process. Is there one project that really kind of stands out? You were, you were just about to describe to me a, a satellite project that you worked on or something? I or? recently built a fake satellite for a visual artist who was doing a multimedia piece. Okay. And it ended up looking like a uh, metal sphere. Most satellites are spheres, uh, seven wow. feet in diameter. And we built it right here in the middle of the shop floor. Jeez. And then uh, she came in and we did all of the, uh, the sort of um, the visual effects, the patinas, the nicks, the scratches that all tell yeah. part of the story story to it and um, yeah that was a really that's huge seven feet in diameter is a big ball like, that's a big piece weighed of weighed about half a ton it weighed a half a ton it was made out of big metal then it, it was made out of foil. quarter inch thick steel plate wow and how do you make a ball out of a quarter inch uh, steel you, plate you take a whole bunch of little pieces that have the right curve and you weld them all together and then you <laughs> grind away all the welds so it Whoa. looks like they're not there anymore okay so bring that over here Clamp that down. So we can just take this now and cool that off. Yeah. That's amazing. So what is it specifically about the Myelin that, uh, that appeals? I'd say the best thing about where I am right now is, um, you know, I knew that this was a neighborhood that didn't have anyone offering a service like that, but had a lot of different people who were in similar businesses that often need to, you know, pull from somebody who, who does metal work. So, you know, around here there's a lot of architects, there's a lot of industrial designers, there's a lot of woodworkers, there's a lot of artists. Um, and all of those people, more than 50% of my clients are within two kilometer radius of wow. where we're standing right That's now. That's crazy. It's amazing. There we go, Alex, all cleaned up. Looks good. Only one problem. This piece of steel was discarded from railroad service for a very good reason. It was developing a crack. Ah, uh, it's broken. So we'll have to start again. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Come back Monday morning. You got the job. Yeah. It's no surprise that many of today's Mylan makers have set up shop in the district's historically industrial sector. The area's architecture illustrates a long tradition of manufacturing in the region. In 1895, the railway came to the Mylan leading to an influx of manufacturers eager to take advantage of the connection. Some of these large 19th century factories remain today, converted into lofts and office space. When the rail lines closed, Montreal's booming garment trade moved in, constructing factories and warehouses along De Gaspé. In the early 90s, an influx of artists happy to take advantage of the cheap rents created by industrial vacancy, and young families attracted to the neighborhood's Victorian architecture revitalized the neighborhood. This, in turn, attracted new industries, reinvigorating the region's heritage of creativity.
Fashion designer Jennifer Glasgow started out in the fine arts and later created costumes for Cirque du Soleil. Today, Jennifer brings her artistic sensibility to fashion with a women's line sold throughout Canada. What do you consider yourself? Are you an artisan, are you a manufacturer, or are you a fashion designer, or are all, all three? I think it would have to be a fine mix of all three of those. Um, I don't think you can be one without the other. And the steep learning curve as well. For me, I started off more of an artisan, only making small batches, making little hats here and there, and selling at craft fairs and markets. Yeah. And then moving into um, manufacturing, which was a totally scary endeavor, but it had to be done at some point in order to fill the orders. So the more we started reaching out to stores across Canada, the more we had to learn. Okay. So from that point, we became a manufacturer. And in order to do that, you have to keep them excited about, the stores excited about what you're actually producing. So in that way, I'm a designer. It's a mix. I always made clothing as part of my life uh, as part of my art and then I just realizing that all through high school all I really wanted to do was make fashion but my my performance art was uh, imbued with fashion I guess you could say so I just ventured off into more costuming yeah. I did costumes for a long time uh, I worked with um, many sort of drag artists dancers choreographers So we moved to Montreal in 95. All right. I moved here for a boy. You moved here and for And stayed a boy. here for fashion. <laughs> so what is it about Montreal that, uh, that keeps you stuck here? What keeps me stuck here is a combination of everything that I love about Montreal in terms of it's uh, accessible as a port city. Uh, I can bring in fabrics from all over the world. It has that European feel to it uh, in terms of fashion and people tend to explore a little bit more um, with their fashion sense. And so that lends itself well to my exploration as well. So, these are your patterns. These are many seasons worth of patterns. Oh wow, there's so many. It's, you must be very proud of this. It's an ongoing uh, process. We often end up getting rid of a bunch. The ones that stick around are the ones that we love. So this one is from fall, winter, this season. Dress. It's uh, called the Aurora. It's one of our most popular. It looks like nothing on the hook. It's nice to see you've got wonderful printing. So this is the dress. This is the dress that I just showed you the pattern for. That's beautiful. Thanks. Wow. Jennifer Glasgow, there it is. Look, made in Montreal. Huh. When I moved into this building four or five years ago, I was filled with um, sewers and all my cutters and all that. So for me, it is the perfect size. It has all the equipment that I need to use to build a collection. And then from here, we take it and send it out to all the necessary parties that work with us in terms of sewers, gradation people for making the different sizes for our patterns. Yeah, it's kind of central. It's central, it's centralized. My store is right around the corner, so I manage to go from home to work very easily, and if I miss something, I can run it over to my store. Wow. This is a really fun little outfit. I wanted something for myself that I could wear to a casual party, so I found this amazing sequin eye cat. Mm -hmm. And we've done it in a mini skirt, but not too mini. Uh, it looks great with a casual t-shirt uh, like we have here. This is one of our basics line called La Croix. And it's worn with an Ose Duro necklace, which is uh, recycled brass from Ghana. Cool.
Men and women have very different sensibilities when they're looking for garments. Um, women, especially in Montreal, there's a huge uh, tendance, uh, trend towards buying Montreal-made or Quebec-made garments. This is great. Uh, they're exploring, they're very adventurous with their fashion, and men, men are always looking for the same thing. They'll buy five of the same garment. I feel like Montreal offers something so special to us uh, as the artisan, the designer, and the manufacturer, and the boutique owner. I have access to so many different talents and industry people that I would never have in another city. I'm very well taken care of because of the access to uh, my industry people, the cutters, the sewers on the second floor here in my building, um, my store is so close by, and we have this great community. It's a great place to be, and the Myland has treated me well, and I hope to treat it well back. <laughs> How's it going? Yeah, fun. Thank you. Sweet. So what do we got? Approved. Approved. Let's, <laughs> let's do it. Okay. Yep. So I'll good. talk to you later. Okay. okay. Bye. Hi, everybody. In 2009, Jesse Herbert left his job as an engineer and began making leather goods. Starting out on Venice Beach, Jesse moved to Montreal and established Oopsmark, a specialty leather goods operation like no other. I guess I'd consider myself a maker because I consider making to be a transferable skill. Um, I like making physical products like this. I like making the websites. I like making the music for my videos. I like making the videos. There's so many different things to do, and uh, having been in a narrow job before, I always wanted to do more things and expand the type of things I was learning. And so with this environment, I get to do that. This is sort of a second iteration of my career, so I thought, you know, why don't I make it the way I want it to be? It's mine. So I mostly stand at the stand-up desk, have like a wobble board to stand on, uh, have like a yoga wall here, have like couches to sit down on. Most of the surfaces in here I raise up so that it's good for your posture and just try and make it an all-around great work environment. Being able to have a loading dock. You know, this is an industrial building, and when I order leather, I order it directly from the tannery, and I can get it delivered from a transport truck. But if I was in a different location, I wouldn't be able to have that. Here we go. All right, here we go. This machine over here, like the clicker there to use, weighs 2,500 pounds with oil in it. I'll use the clicker to cut out the leather, because if we did it all by hand, it'd have carpal tunnel syndrome already. Yeah. And I'd like to be making things for a long, long way down in the future. So this is our second most selling cycling accessory, and it holds a, a U-lock on the back of the bike. It really works the best on the saddle with tabs on the back. Mm -hmm. So you lived in LA. Yeah. How did you come to Montreal? Uh, well, I lived here briefly um, in my early 20s, and I'd moved around a lot. And everywhere I lived, I always wanted to move back to Montreal. It just, for me, it was the quality of life. So when people ask me why I live here, I tell them for a better quality of life. All the neighborhoods are a little bit different, and it's a little bit transient. There's always people coming from international places, and it's, uh, there's a joie de vivre here and all that stuff. Yeah. And, uh, in English, we don't have a term for joie de vivre. No, you I don't say joie de vivre. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, oh. Tell me about trial and error, making mistakes, yeah. and, and how, you, how you get to it. Well, it just makes me think of the name Oopsmark, which is a, a mistake you'd make while you're making something. Okay. And if you look at it as a mistake, you kind of get shut down and demoralized. But if you work with it, sometimes it can lead you in directions that you wouldn't have conceived of as a designer. The bicycle wine rack, for example, I didn't think was something people really wanted. I was taking a break from working on something else, and a friend wanted something like that, so I put it online and it just took off. City cycling is a growing industry, and 
people are finding, yeah, I like to drink wine and carrying it on my bike, bicycle is really awkward. Sure. And I go to a friend's house for dinner and I want to be invited back. <laughs> so. Yeah. So this is sort of the, the nerve center of Voops Mark, hey? This is your website? Yeah, this is our website for our customers. Let's check out the blogs. Want to see right. the blogs? Yeah, I want to see a blog. Let's see. And the videos. Yeah, that hook is amazing. I, I want to know more about it's really that. It's messy. It was time to get organized, so naturally, I made a grapple hook and hung it from the ceiling. Now we were talking about niches before and how some of the niches are really small. This is a blog post featuring this product we put out called a grapple hook, and it's for hanging your jeans. So you know you've got that chair in your living room that you throw your jeans on and yeah. then they get all wrinkled and you're looking for your pants and you can't find them and you don't get to use the chair. Right. Well the idea for this is it hangs your jeans so they don't get all wrinkled and then you can use your chair for something else. I also hung one in my front hall, hang jackets, umbrellas and hats on. You could use it to hang all kinds of things. So it's fun to uh, have customers all over, all over the world. Like New Zealand, for instance, is the number one consumer of bicycle wine racks per capita in the world. <laughs> they obviously cycle a lot and drink a lot of wine. I want to go there. What is it about the Myelin that really uh, turns you on? Well, it's great to be around other makers, coming here and seeing other examples of people making things and you know running successful businesses has been very useful. Okay. It's sort of giving me you know, people to ask questions to or people to collaborate with. Hey, I'm working on Google Analytics. I don't know how to do this. Or, hey, I need a branding thing. What do you think? Or, you know, people will contact me and say, hey, Jess, I'm working on this. Do you have any suggestions? Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not like you can learn this stuff at school. It's the accessibility of it makes it, uh, is really valuable. That's really neat. And the, uh, the cohesion of the neighborhood is just increasing all the time. There's a lot of development happening here and more coffee shops, so you can, you know, in a casual way, be chatting with a neighbor and say, hey, I'm having a problem with this. Oh, I dealt with that last week. You should try this. parties every once in a while where we bring in the community and we make stuff out of the scrap materials because we don't want to waste it. It's fun to bring the making experience to them, but yeah. it's also helpful to just get that circulation of ideas happening. It's really intense and it happens all evening long and people have a lot of fun. Practice cutting the leather first. The Mile End has always been a place where things get made. Look what I made. Its history is one of creativity, innovation, and entrepreneurial vision. It is simultaneously a place to work and a place to live. A melting pot of business and art, this unique neighborhood exemplifies the revitalizing energy of urban manufacturing. We've seen it through the eyes of the makers we've met today, shining examples of what is made in Montreal.